Yeah. Well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, everyone, that's. Let's see. So today, what I want to do is uh, talk to you a little bit more about the illumination tree. All right. So um, we left off looking at these two theorems, and I proved them to you, right? So I showed you that, and the pictures of them are probably easier to, to understand, that uh, if this is non-zero, uh, then that's non-zero. Or if, I'm sorry, if, if, if AIK is non-zero, then LKI is non-zero. Okay, so that's this uh, is, the, is the same entry as that. And then the other theorem says that if these two entries are non-zero, then that one is too. Okay, because of the way the reach works in the triangular solve. Um, this entry right here is that entry. So these, these two imply that one. Uh, so this gives us the elimination tree because then in the reach we can ignore this entry right here. And so we end up with an elimination tree. So now the question is, uh, how is it possible? And the answer is yes, otherwise I guess we wouldn't answer the, ask the question. Can you compute the elimination tree uh, beforehand, not from L, but just from the A matrix? All right. And uh, the answer is yes. And so there's a couple theorems I need to prove, and I'm going to try to walk through them carefully. And the first one is this one right here. I'm not sure if you can see the bottom of that, but it's, it's yeah, I guess it's here, and it's also uh, in your book. <clears throat> so um, the idea here, and I can write it in two different ways. So we've got an i, j, and a k. And here's an i, and here's a j, and here's a k. And the theorem says that, again, neglecting numerical cancellation, um, if l, k, i is non-zero, then I is a descendant of K in the tree. That's what the theorem says. It's not an if and only if thing, by the way. I can be a descendant of K with LKI being zero. But if LKI is non-zero, K bigger than I, of course, because otherwise I guess this wouldn't make any sense. Well, it could be a k equal i, then that's that's redundant. So i is the descendant of the k in the tree. Equivalently, there's a path from i to k in the tree. So we're going to talk. I use this notation i squiggle arrow k. I'll use that a lot, and that means there's a path from i to k. I could mean that in a directed graph or an undirected graph. I'll still use the arrow in either case. And so the proof is by induction on the length of the path. And so here's the idea. First of all, um, let's suppose, and we can, for the moment, erase J for the base case. Okay. Let's suppose that K is the first off-diagonal, so this is the base case of the length of the path. The path length will be 1. So let's suppose that all of this is 0 here. If all of that is zero, well, then I is the child of K. And there's certainly a path from I to K. Done. So that's the base case. Well, now we ask the question, well, what if there's another guy here? And that's where J comes in. What if there is an, uh, some, and now we have I has to be, J has to be between I and K. So this, was, this first case, the base case, I is just less than K. And there's, there is no such j. Now there is a j such that Lji is non-zero. And furthermore, let's consider not just any particular j, but if there is such a j, there's going to be a least j. So if there is any non-zero in here, if there's two or three of them, well, then there's going to be one with the smallest row index. And there's a name for that theorem. Every non-empty set has a minimum or something like that. Um, and so let's suppose that J is the least 
is the least of these, my brethren. <laughs> okay. Uh, so suppose J is the least of these, and that what does that mean? We have now I is a child of J in the illumination tree. Okay. But now something else happens. And this is where we can then use the inductive step, uh, uh, use the induction to, to finish the, this proof off. This proof is by, as I said, induction on the length of the path. K is up here somewhere. And then we're asking the question now, well, is there a path from J to K? Well, because of the previous theorem that we just looked at, we have this little triumvirate here of three entries. Remember, these two entries imply this one is non-zero. I, I just showed you that last class. And you can look at this in terms of reach with a triangular solve. Uh, it may also be helpful, by the way, to think about it, think about that little thing in another in another sense. Think about Gaussian elimination. So let's forget edges and paths and all that. Let's just look at matrices. Okay. And let's look at doing just plain LU factors of Gaussian elimination. You're familiar with that. Um, but on a symmetric pattern matrix with no pivoting. All right. Let's suppose it the lower triangular matrix looks like this. Well, if the lower triangular matrix looks like this, the upper triangular matrix will look like that as well because the thing is symmetric. Now, do one step of Gaussian elimination. Take this row, add it here and here, and those two become non-zero because of fill-in. So that's another way of understanding that previous theorem here. You can explain this theorem with a the triangular solve and the reach and the paths and, oh, you don't have to, this impl path implies that and so forth, as I did before, or you can look at it this way here, just with matrices. In fact, that's, I think, how it was first proven with just looking at the matrix structure, not looking at reach and trees, because the tree actually post-dated sparse Cholesky factorization. It was only after people were doing sparse Cholesky they realized, hey, there's something going on here combinatorially. Let's let's figure this out and see what we can do with it. And so now the case is that um, if there is a least j, then we can go from i to the parent j. And now think about what j and k f uh, fulfill. J and k fulfill the conditions of the theorem, just on a shorter path. In other words, the theorem says, not this theorem, this theorem. Replace I with J and you get the same theorem. That is to say, the theorem says, and let me just write down the theorem on the chalk so we can see it here. The theorem says that uh, LKI non-zero and, and uh, I less than K together imply that, and I'll use the word imply here so you don't get, imply there's a path from I to K in the tree. So that's the, that's the theorem. And uh, this is the same theorem, but with just a path of shorter, of length less, of, of one less. So if the theorem is true for a path of whatever length this is, then this proof just shows that it's longer. It's true for a path of one length longer. So we're done. The other way of thinking about this is that, well, okay, you, you, you've gone from I to J. Now the question is, will you reach K? Will you get to K along this road, the yellow brick road here? Will you find Oz at the end? <laughs> okay. The answer is yes, because... You, you can put it off by, you know, stopping at the house of the Wicked Witch of the East or whatever. But eventually you get to Oz because eventually you go, okay, you have a sidetrack. You're trying to go directly from I to Oz, but you can't because, oops, there's a sidetrack in the story here. And so you go here. But if you go here, you, there's going to be an edge. There's going to be a non-zero down here. There's an edge from J to K because of fill-in. So... But you're not going to take that. You may take that directly. So if this is all zero, you'll just get to Oz and you're done. But what if there's a bypass? 
Oh, you know, you, you walk through the, the field of the flowers. <laughs> okay, should I drop this analogy? <laughs> All right. You, there's another bypass. Oops. Well, if this there's another bypass, then there's a non-zero here. You can't put off the inevitable, though. You see, eventually, you, the, the space for where all the zeros can be, that, that is to say there's no bypass, eventually squeezes out to nothing. And eventually, you, you would have to reach k minus 1. And now there's no way you can. There will be that entry there. And now there's no way you can uh, escape reaching k. So you, you will get to k. If you walk up the tree from parent to parent to parent to parent, from i to j, you'll get to k. You can't avoid hitting k. All right. So um, then uh, this theorem I already ex already explained to you that we can throw away the reach. To, to compute the kth row of L, um, I'm just going to restate this then in, in for formal terms, my bow tie on, you know, my tux, that if I want to find the reach of the kth column of A in the graph G, uh, GK minus 1, which is the graph of LK minus 1, the first K minus 1 rows and columns of A, then I can just find the reach in the tree instead. All right, I showed you that like two classes ago now. So now we come to this notion of the row subtrees. And this is what captures the entire structure of the non-zero pattern of the matrix L, which is what our goal is. Right? We want to, we're trying to get at what is L? What's the combinatoric structure of L? Where are the things non-zero? How many of them are, are there? And so forth. Because we want to lay out our, our work before we do it. I mean, if you're doing this in parallel, or even if you're doing it sequentially, you want to lay out a static data structure and, and know exactly what to do. You've got to find this pattern of L before you compute it, uh, just like with the triangular solve, make things efficient. And so now we come to the row subtrees. The, uh, see, this, this theorem right here, LKI non-zero and I less than K imply there's a path from I to K, this means that, now th think about this, the non-zero pattern of the K throw of L. What will it look like? Well, what it looks like is a collection of paths in the tree, subpaths in the tree, rooted at K, because you don't go any farther than K. You stop here at K. All these paths will lead to K. I just showed you that. If you start at I, you will reach K. So if this is non-zero, you, if you follow this path, you'll get to k. Parent, you go from, from here to a parent, to a parent, and then finally, apparently, to k. <laughs> okay, you'll reach k. Now, and so what we have here is a collection of paths, all of which lead to k. So the question is, where do they start? Now, they do not necessarily, this, this tree that I've drawn is not just simply the subtree, the complete subtree of t rooted at k. That's too extensive. That's too much. Uh, one way to see that is to look, for example, at this factorization of a tridiagonal matrix. This is all zero. The tree is a chain. One, two, three, to n. If I were to stop at k and ask, well, um, what's the non-zero pattern of the kth row? Dot, dot, dot. It's not completely non-zero. Okay, so it's, I'm not looking at classical subtrees where you just have, okay, here's a tree and here's node K and just consider all its descendants. No, it's different than that. The question is, how, how, then, how does this tree form? The only way this tree forms 
is because of the triangular solve. By putting your fingers down on nodes of the right-hand side, which is a column of the A matrix, and following those fingers, going to parent, to parent, to parent, until you stop at K, because you will reach K. So how does this tree form? Well, we know that if AKI is non-zero, then LKI is non-zero, and that's what starts the tree off. That's what starts the search off. And then we know that if LKI is non-zero, so this is node I, then there's a then there's a then we're going to follow a path from I to K in the tree. And as we follow the path, of course, well, those are all nodes we can reach. So they're all non-zero in L, just as I've shown here. If you start at I, and I is not the child of K, it's some descendant of K. If it's not the child, it's a grandchild, or a great-grandchild, or a great-great, you know, so forth. So if you start here at I in the non-zero pattern, consider the non-zero pattern of K, you're going to see collections of these subpaths, because if you start with this non-zero, then that will force J to be non-zero, where J is the parent of I. So if you start here, you'll see J. And J will be non-zero in the, in the row of the kth row of L. And then the parent will be non-zero of that, and the parent and the parent. And so the row of K is consisting of collections of these subpaths, but they don't just start at the very root of the entire tree. They start just at these nodes I for which this is true. Well, namely this one, because if that's true, this is true. In other words, they start at the positions of the original matrix A. So all of these leaves then, all of these leaves are non-zeros in A. And since A is symmetric, it doesn't really matter whether we talk about them uh, in, in the, col the, A, the, the kth column or the kth row. Because we're doing this triangular solve, and we have here the kth column of A that, caught, that starts the, the, the search off. It doesn't really matter if we, if we go here or if we look at it here, because it's, it's the one and the same thing, right? The matrix is symmetric. And this is where it really helps to be dyslexic, <laughs> because you can look at both of them at the same time and realize, and let your brain oscillate. Maybe you can't do this. I don't know. I, I, at first, you know, rows and columns don't have any meaning to me. I can see both at the same time, and so my brain just sort of oscillates like a sinusoid between the two, and it doesn't pin itself down. So it doesn't matter to me. I can look at kth row and kth column, and I see the same thing, and I'm saying the same thing over and over again because it's awesome. My brain is like, stop, stop. Okay, now, thank you. Sorry, reboot. So these are the non-zeros in the kth row or the kth column. There's a, there's a row index i. There's an a. Actually, this is aik non-zero. But equivalently, it's also aki non-zero. So that's an i in this list. And that's an i here of one of these leaves. So every leaf is a non-zero in a. And so if we want to find the non-zero pattern of the kth row of L, we could just start at all of those non-zeros. Oh, but wait, we've per perhaps overcounted. See, I've drawn circles around the leaves, but in fact, there's more. Because it could also happen that this non-zero could occur not just in L, because it will be there in L. If this non-zero is here, and there's a path, then all these nodes along the way correspond to non-zeros in the matrix L, whether or not they were originally non-zero. But what if, say, there's an entry along here, I'll call it T, such that uh, it's in the kth row of L, so it's L, K, T. Uh, this will be non-zero because there's some entry down here, S, such that A, K S is non-zero, and there's a path from S through T to K, and so that implies that L K T will be non-zero. 
But it could also, of course, be that AKT is non-zero as well. So these non-zeros in A fall into two categories. The non-zeros in the K through of L fall into two categories, leaves of this subtree and not leaves of the subtree. Leaves of the subtree, not leaves. So, and you, another way to look at this is, is through that reach idea. So, the, so how do you find the K through value to a triangular solve? What do you do a triangular, what do you do the reach? To, the answer to this, the question is finding a reach in the graph. Put your fingers on and see where you, on the graph and see where you can go. Well, if where you can go is from one finger to the other, well then you, you could have just ignored, well, I have to be careful <laughs> which finger I ignore. You can ignore, if you wish, and you only have to actually start at the leaves. And they would fully characterize the tree. These extra entries are fine, they're there, but they're redundant. They're redundant in the sense that if they were not there, the graph of L does not change. So there's a notion in which we can take our matrix A, we can take our matrix A, just symbolically speaking, and we can drop some of the entries. And we get instead, and I think I call it A, a squiggle in the notation, we get a different matrix A, and there's a name, it's called the skeleton matrix. I think I introduced that later on. And I think I used the notation A squiggle, if I remember. So that's where we get this right here. And so to look at this, I guess you also have to look at the picture of L at the same time. Um, and I don't have that, have that up. Maybe I'll just... Uh, Let's see, how about if I do this? How about if I make a copy of one of these subtrees? So what I've drawn here on, the, on this figure is all the row subtrees. So let's, let's, take, let's take one in particular. Um, let's take, how about T6? I think that might be interesting. T6, now that's, that's boring because that's a complete subtree. Six, seven, six, one. Uh, that's interesting. How about 10? 10 is really interesting. 10 is a real big one. Okay. So I'm going to write the, the T, T sub 10. So this is the 10th row subtree. And I'll write it, I'll, I'll echo it here on the board. 8, 3, and then I'll go back to their slide. 9, 7, 6, 4. Okay. So that's the tenth row subtree uh, of of the graph of L or of the elimination tree. Either way, let's go back here. So now this is the entire elimination tree. So if I were to do the, the triangular solve at the tenth step, I would take these four entries: one, two, three, four of them, and let me write them down. It's three, four, six, and nine. 3, 4, 6, and 9. 3, 4, 6, and 9. And I now need to do the reach in graph uh, in the in the T sub sub 9 graph. Which is to say that says throw away all nodes above 9. So throw these two away. So now here's our elimination tree we have so far. This is actually now a forest. But what I have here now, if I cover that, this structure here is the elimination tree of the leading 9 by 9 submatrix of L. Right? If you see, for example, a parent of 9, there is no parent of 9. And, and 8 has no parent either because I just sliced off the last two rows. But everybody else still has a parent. So it's a forest. Okay, and now let's do the reach in this graph from 3, 4, 6, and 9. So if I start at 3, I find 3 and 8, and then I hit the end of the world, and so I must be reaching 10. So I'll put 10 as my parent there. 
And if I start at 4, I start here and I go 4, 6, 7, 9, and I stop here. But if I start at 6, it's redundant. I go 6, 7, 9, and I stop here at 10. I don't need that. And the same thing happens if I start at 9. And so, so this is non-zero in the original matrix, 3, and so is 4, and so is 6, and so is 9. But 6 and 9 are not needed. I would have, if I, if I did the triangular solve, if I did the reach, and I started, say, with just 3 and 4, and I did the reach from 3, and I found, okay, then I stop at 10, and I started at 4, and I stop at 10. Now I'll start at 6, and I'll say, oh, I already have 6, forget it, skip it. And I'll look at 9, I'll start at 9, oh, 9's already seen, okay, skip it. Then I would have this, this structure. Of course, if I started at 6 and 9 and did 3 and 4, I would find something different. I'd still find the same structure. Um, but the key thing here is that I could have started just at nodes 3 and 4. Those nodes 3 and 4 are going to be very important. Those are the entries in the skeleton matrix. So, so what I could do here, and I don't know, I think later on I have the skeleton matrix of this, but it's not on my slides yet. Um, I could have taken this, the 10th row and column here, these entries, and I could have pruned these two entries right here, six in rows six and nine and in column six and nine here. In other words, had I taken them out of the original matrix A, they still would be an L because they would just be look, they would just look different. They'd be fill-in entries with these little X's and circles but they'd still be there. Okay, so um, how do we know that uh, what these leaves are? So a node, and this is the next theorem then that I'm leading up to here. We have this notion of the kth row subtree, which I've just drawn T10 here. Node J is a leaf if and only if it's a non-zero in the A matrix, A, J, K, or equivalently A, K, J, either way. You know, A, J, K, and A, K, J, those are, those are twins from the subcontinent of Asia, right? <laughs> well, that was really bad. See, so I could say that because there's no, there's no Indians here today. Um, but they'll, they'll slaughter me later, I'm sure. Okay. Uh, so if AJK is non-zero, then it's a leaf. But also, AIK has to be non-zero for every descendant of I, I of J in the tree. In other words, it's, while it's true that A610 is non-zero, okay, it has a descendant in the tree. Now, notice this is just the plane tree, not the row subtree. Because if there's another non-zero, so if, I, if, I, if I'm at a node uh, J, then if in the elimination tree, I've got some descendant here, which corresponds to a non-zero in my matrix, in the 10th row or 10th column, Either way. Well, then, if I start at this non-zero, I'm going to find J. So J is not a leaf of this row subtree. But this guy is instead. So this theorem then characterizes all of these leaves. All of these leaves correspond to all of those non-zeros in A that have a very special property in that they have no, there's no descendants in the tree uh, that are also non-zeros in that kth row of A. So this one would be left out because it has a descendant, namely that one, that's non-zero in A. So now this characterizes the uh, all the row subtrees. The, 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 every row subtree now is fully characterized by those entries, the leaves and the tree, because the tree is the same for every row. I mean, the, the elimination tree is the same for every row. If I go, whoops, if I go here, all of these trees are subtrees of the same elimination tree. They just start in different places. 
and they all finish at their corresponding root. So T1 stops at 1, T3 the root is 3, T6 the root is 6, and so forth. So the, the roots at the very top are 1 through 11. But here, for instance, T11, you see the leaves 3, 5, and 7. So let's go back to the tree and see if that makes sense. 3, 5, and 7, Remem remember that. So that's just right here, 3, 5, and 7. And the tree you saw was this, the, sub, the, the 11 throw subtree. 3, 5, and 7. So let's look here, here at the A matrix. We have 3, we have 5, we have 7. Okay, But we also have 8 and 10. But they're not leaves because I find them along the way. So they're not necessary to characterize the, the, ten, the 11th row subtree. Okay, so finally now with these theorems, um, there's now, we're, we're, what I'm doing here with these theorems is I'm building up a way of actually computing the tree. Because how do we compute the tree? Remember I explained last class that, well, if we didn't know the tree and we wanted to build it one node at a time, we could start with we could build it incrementally. We could start with the tree of the leading submatrix and then compute this row. And then if we find any new non-zeros here, which are which are all zero above it, then we make that node i the child of k. But you see, what is this row? This row right here is the kth row subtree of my final elimination tree. So all I have to do now to build the tree is start at these leaves for every non-zero in that kth row of A, walk up the tree I've built so far, because the tree I've built so far is perfectly here. It's everything here except for K. Walk up until I reach a dead end, and the parent of that dead end must be K walk up until I reach a root which, which is not k, and then the parent of that root must be k. And that fully characterizes the tree, and so I've just extended the tree by one node by doing that. All I've got to do is start here at all these leaves and walk up and put k as their root. And so what happens is then, uh, so are you with me so far? It's, it's uh, If not, you could ask me later, I guess, but, but please do ask me later. So what's happening here is I've got these subtrees. And I've got k here, which is no, not yet part of my tree. So I have here t sub k minus 1. So it's, the, it's not the k minus first row subtree. It's the tree from this line below. It's the tree of this entire graph, entire graph of L, the leading k minus 1 part. So I start at a non-zero in A, and I walk upwards. As I walk upwards, though, I mean, I'm traversing paths I've seen before. It's a well-beaten trail to get to. All i got to do is get to this root and then do that. So I walk up here, if I stop before k, then the parent of this must be k. And I go here, say another non-zero, and then I come up here and, oh, I've reached k, so there's no work to do. And then I come here and I walk up to the root, but of course, it's like, I've, done, I've seen this path before. Some, some redundant work going on here. Can I have, can I, if I've seen this path before, can I take a shortcut? I come to the root and then, oh, I get stuck. Oh, well, that must be k. And if that's all that happens at the kth step, then that's the, that is t sub k. It's the tree of the leading k minus 1 part. Can, yeah, you can see it all on the screen. Okay, so, and these will have roots. These will have parents, I'm sorry, which are larger than k, because I didn't start, didn't find any 
non-zeros there to start with. So this is a way of building the tree then, isn't it? We start at a, at a node in a subtree and walk up until we hit a dead end. And then if we hit a dead end, oh, your parent must be K. That's all we have to do. And that builds the tree. In other words, there's a, there's a corollary to this, to this row sub, to, to this theorem and I should, that I should state more, more formally. Um, I, I showed earlier on here that if, whoops, went too far back. This, this theorem here, this is by Rob Schreiber, says that um, if LKI is non-zero, then there's a path from I to K in the tree. But with pruning these entries by realizing, hey, wait a minute, I don't need to look at all of those LKIs to, look, to define the tree. I can define the tree now uh, with an if and only if statement that says that the only way I can, I can With, no, I'm sorry, it's not an if and only if. I can take that theorem and take out LKI and put AKI. So if AKI is non-zero, then there's a path from I to K in the tree. Because of this idea. So if this is non-zero, then I'll walk up and I'll find K. If, LK, if, if AKI is non-zero. So this gives us a picture now of how to build the tree. We start with no tree at all, or if you will, the, the, T, the T1, let's see, the, the T0 tree, is that every node is in its own, every node is its own subtree. There's no edges in the tree at all. It's a forest. It's more like bushes, bracken, right? <laughs> little small undergrowth, right? There's no trees at all. And then we start this process here. We have the T0 tree. We start with non-zeros in the, f in the first, it's kind of, kind of trivial, the first row, and it'd just be this one, and we stop. Nothing happens. So, But to find the T2 tree, we have the T1 tree. This is also T1 then. I could have started at 1. The T2 tree says that, um, what's the tree of the leading two by two matrix? Well, it's this, now this structure here. I have a leading matrix of size K minus one and I want to extend it by one. And you get this picture here. You start at non-zeros in the kth, which is now two, the second row here, which there could only be one of them, which is namely one. And you walk up. If you get stuck and stop before hitting two, then, oh, well, two must be the parent of one. And so that would be T2 if this is non-zero and so forth. And then eventually you're, you're continuing this way. You have the K minus first tree and you go to the K tree by walking up paths and then getting stuck at K. And then K must be your parent. And we only, because of this theorem here, we only have to start at, at and because of the triangular solve, you only have to start at nodes corresponding to non-zeros in A. So we could, we could finish here. I mean, this could be the algorithm right here. If we've got the TK minus one tree already and to go to the kth tree, we start at non-zeros in the kth row of A. So this is an AKI which is non-zero. There's that an I. We just walk the tree, talk, 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 talk. Oh, there's a root. Set the root's parent to be K. Start here, walk, 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 walk. Hit here and do the same thing. But now we're traversing these paths over and over again. It gets really tiring. I mean, think of K plus one. What's gonna happen if this again is non-zero? We're going to go plod, 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 plod. You're going to see this. You're going to see this entry again. You're going to walk that same path. Then you're going to walk to K and get stuck, and then realize the parent of K is K plus one. So.
So if only we had a shortcut. Let's make a shortcut that says, well, everyone in this, think of this as a subset now. Just a set of nodes with a master, with a representative that represents this entire subset. It's the root of this whole subtree. And in fact, it's not just a row subtree, it's the entire elimination tree subtree. It's this one right here. It's a subtree of K, it's subtree of T rooted at, I don't know, what I want to call this, S or something. It, there's a bunch of descendants of S. And if I start a path from any of these up towards K, I'm going to walk through S. So let's take a shortcut. Let's make all these nodes, let's add a shortcut that says, oh, the, the most distant known ancestor of S, of I, I'm sorry, is S. It's sort of like in genealogy. If you're looking at your Y chromosome, your mitochondrial chromosome, what's important is not who your father is, but who your most distant known ancestor is. So in my case, it's Noah Davis, born in New Jersey in 1792. Father of William Wilson, father of Theodore, father of Carl, father of Robert, father of me. <laughs> okay. My great, great, great grandfather. So I'm walking up my parental, parental tree to my father, to my father's father, father. Well, if I walk this again, I'm going to come to Noah Davis all over again. So let's just remember the fact that, oh, yeah, it's Noah Davis. Just jump there in one step rather than walking this path. And if we had this magical shortcut, then, that what would be the time complexity of computing the elimination tree? If we had this magical shortcut that always worked. And it, with no, pretend we didn't have to compute this magical shortcut then the question is, what is the time taken to compute the elimination tree with this method? Order of non-zero is an A, exactly. Because you have a unit of work here to do for non-zero in the A matrix. And the goal is to find the root of your subtree and then set the parent to K. Which, if you can go from here to here in constant time, then you can do the whole work in constant time per non-zero, per this non-zero, a constant amount of work for this non-zero in the A matrix. And so if we had this magical shortcut, then, um, then we take time proportional to non-zeros in A. Well, we can't do that exactly, but we can get close. There's a name for this algorithm, and it's called the disjoint set, dis, the disjoint union find problem. If you've had enough algorithms knowledge to, to reach that, what we have is a collection of subsets, each with a representative master. Okay, and you want to do two things with this with these subsets. One, you want to find, given a node, you want to ask, well, what, you, it's the find question. What subset are you in? Here, what subset are you in? Oh, you're in this one. This one is, is and, the, and the answer is what, of what subset you're in is given by the master of the subset. This is the representative node or the master node of this subset, the root of this tree. But there's really no tree anymore. We can, we can, we can throw away the tree and just think of subsets. So you have, a group, you have a subset here, and a subset here, and a subset here, and a subset here. But each of these subsets has a representative, like you know, the legislation, the legislator. Okay. So who's your legislator? And uh, so that's the find question, to find out who is your legislator, who is your master of your subset. The other operation here is to do a... Uh, a union of two disjoint subsets. Because, well, the first, the first time you come across, suppose you just have this, and it's the first time you see K. Well, then really all this would do would be to say, there's my new subset. And K is now the master of the subset. So that would be a, a minor, I mean, that's not really a, 
uh, uh, union of two subsets, although I suppose it could be thought of as a subset of two sets, the set S and the set K by itself. So you're taking a union of two subsets. And then if you, you go here and you would do the find operation, you're at this node and you do a find, you find, oh, this is master is T. And now what you need to do is merge two subsets together, K and T together, into a single subset with the master being K. That's called the disjoint, uh, these sets are disjoint. It's called the disjoint set union find algorithm. There's two operations you want to support, the union of two disjoint subsets and the find operation which, which says, given, a, given an item, find the master of the subs of the uh, find the master of the subset in which that item lives. It's like who's your representative of your county, and then the merge is like, you know, gerrymandering two counties together into a single set. So they only have one master, and finally, there's only it's it's moving from a democracy to the to a monarchy. You have a single root <laughs> when you're done. Well, there's a way of doing this, and I'm not going to explain it. Uh, to do it optimally, it turns out there's a there's a method uh, that's fairly elaborate, and the time complexity is almost for doing a of these non-zero and a. It's almost order a, but not quite. There's something called an inverse Ackerman function here. So it's the non-zero is a times the inverse Ackerman function, and the inverse Ackerman function is a function that grows extremely slowly in n or in the, in the input to the function. I mean, if, I don't know, I, I forget off the, off the top of my head how big it is, but if, if n is like the number of particles in the universe, then f of n, the inverse Ackerman function, is like five. Okay, it's, it is not, it's not a constant. This, this function goes like this. It does grow, but if you're out here at 10 to the 80, this is five, okay. So for all practical purposes, this is five. <laughs> okay, asymptotically it's not five because it'll get bigger than five if you have more. If you have a graph that's bigger than the known than the particles of the number of atoms and electrons in the known universe. Okay, so it's extremely slowly growing. The algorithm we'll we'll use though is not this elaborate. We actually will have here an extra logarithmic term instead. But this extra logarithmic term in practice doesn't actually occur really. I mean, you, you never see this logarithmic term. This is a very pessimistic worst case bound. And in practice, this is effectively a constant. So in by, by this, what happens is, I mean, if we were worried about this log A, we could use the elaborate method that has the inverse Ackerman function. We get this exceedingly slow growing function. And that's what is meant by something that is almost linear time. If you have a function, that, if you have a, a computation that takes n times the inverse Ackerman function time, then you call it almost linear. It's not even n log n. It's not even n log log n. It's n times five for any n of interest. But it's really not n times five. So that's why we say almost linear time. So how do you do this? Well, the, 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 the simplest way to do this is the following. We want to know who our ancestors are. Well, we keep track of, of, of a list of most recently known ancestors. It may not be perfect, but it's sort of like a shortcut. So what happens is as we traverse this path, all along this path, we know we're going to reach K at the end. So as I walk this path, if the, most distant, if the most distant known ancestor of this node is not K, I'll set it to K, because I know that's where I'm going. So everybody's pointing to K now. Now the next time I walk this path, I'll just jump straight to K. Except it could be later on that K might be made a child of K plus one. So now, if I'm here and I jump to K, I'm not actually to where my final goal is. Suppose I'm doing, I'm, wor I'm working at step T of the algorithm, and T is several steps larger than K. If I start here, I know I'm going to reach T. So whatever I, wherever I go from here, I'm going to set my pointer to T. But 
I'll actually have to go to k first because I haven't found this k plus one, or I haven't found the the root of my root yet. So what happens is then within this subset, you don't actually, you're not actually able to go straight to the root of your subset. You may have to take a few hops. You might, because this ancestor information might be stale. Uh, and so that's what this algorithm does. And I'm uh, now a minute over. But this is what this algorithm does. It keeps track, and I'll elaborate on this next class. It keeps track of a set of ancestors. And as you walk the tree, as you walk these paths, you, walk, you don't walk up the parent. Parent to parent to parent to parent. You jump farther. Ancestor to ancestor to ancestor. Right here. I equals I next. I next is the, is the ancestor. And you set the ancestor to K because that's where you, you, you revise the ancestor because that you know that's where you're going. If you currently do not have an ancestor, then you, you know that you've hit the end of the world and you must set the parent of I to K. And you, then you also know you've finished the, you've reached the end, you've reached the root of your subtree. If I next is minus one, if you've hit the end of the world, if you've hit the root of your subtree, you know you have to reach K, but you've stopped short. Therefore, you know that the child I must have its parent K. And so you set parent of I equal to K. So that's the algorithm. There's the, the extra things in here that, that, that I'll talk about next class, but that's the gist of the algorithm. So take a look at that, and we'll pick up here next time. Thank you.